Hello, my name is David Joyce and I'm one of the cardiovascular surgeons at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Today I'm going to be discussing the topic of left ventricular assist devices with a particular focus on which pumps we select when we have a patient who, who qualifies for one of these surgeries. Now, heart failure is a very common condition, and I would say there's over 5 million people in this country currently who are suffering from symptoms of heart failure. And the most common symptoms that people typically have are shortness of breath. That can range from a little more difficulty doing uh, physical activities all the way to being short of breath, even just sitting in a chair. And unfortunately, it's a little bit difficult to determine where you are on that spectrum of heart failure just based on your symptoms. In fact, it can even be difficult to pinpoint what somebody's prognosis is even after we've done extensive testing. For that reason, it's very important to be seen by an expert in heart failure, usually a heart failure cardiologist, if you start progressing down this pathway. Uh, sometimes we can use medicines to help people get better. Sometimes there's some minor procedures like pacemakers and those sorts of things that can work well. But eventually, a lot of patients will develop end-stage heart failure, and this could be very advanced and very uh, life-threatening. And in those cases, we oftentimes will look at whether or not a transplant or a mechanical support device would be a, an effective treatment. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Perhaps you've already been given the diagnosis of advanced heart failure, and you've been told that you may be a candidate for a device. And you may have looked on the internet and found that there are lots of different devices out there. Well, as it turns out, at Mayo, we have virtually the entire spectrum of devices available to us to implant, and so sometimes that can be very confusing. And today, I just want to kind of give an overview of what the options are and why we select the ones that we do for an individual patient. So to start off with, I just want to go back and give you a little background. There's really three generations of devices. Just like with cell phones, there were the original phones that were the bricks that you would carry around in your car. Then they've evolved all the way down to the smartphones that we use today. The same has been happening with LVAD technology, and LVAD is an acronym for left ventricular assist device. So the early devices that we implanted back in the 80s and 90s were pulsatile devices. So these were devices that would generate a pulse just like the normal human heart. The problem is they're a little bit clunky and uh, didn't last very long. Very often they would break down. Eventually, we ended up developing pumps that have a continuous flow pattern, and these are, are uh, where there's an impeller that just spins around and, and helps the blood flow through the device. These are much smaller, much easier to implant, and much safer than some of the early devices, and there's two varieties. So the first generation of pumps were the pulsatile devices. There's two types of continuous flow devices. The second generation of these devices were the axial flow pumps. And then the third generation, were, which are some of the more recent devices, are ones that the blood flows in a centrifugal pattern. So that's just some background, and I'll use that as a context as we go through each of these different support devices. And before we go into which device is used in which indication, I'd like to kind of just briefly overview each individual device. So the Syncardia Total Artificial Heart, Syncardia is the company that makes the, the pump, is a device that can use, be used to replace the entire human heart. And so we would take the patient to the operating room, remove the heart, and if the patient uh, qualified for this device, just replace the heart with this device. Uh, this is, of course, a, a first-generation pulsatile device. That device has been around really since the 1980s. And uh, the only other pulsatile device that you might hear about is the HeartMate XVE. And this is made by Thoratec, which actually was recently just purchased by St. Jude. So a lot of different companies, a lot of different, um, it can be very confusing in terms of trying to understand, you know, which device belongs where. But, but the Thoratec company has sort of a family of devices. And this was the original one that was used in all of the trials. Unfortunately, it's uh, no longer being implanted anymore, mainly because we just have better, uh, better devices available. Back to the cell phone analogy, you probably wouldn't want to go out and buy one of the early devices at this point because uh, there's newer options available. And one of those newer options is the HeartMate 2. So this is that second generation of, of blood pump, and that's an axial flow pump. And we've been uh, implanting this device for you know, well over 10 years and uh, with very good outcomes. This is uh, obviously much smaller and, and uh, is approved for uh, lots of different indications. There's a new generation of the HeartMate device as well, the HeartMate 3, also produced by Thoratec. And this is one of those third generation centrifugal flow pumps. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of these details in a minute. Then there's another company called Heartware that produces a centrifugal flow device called the HVAD. Uh, 
They also have another smaller version of this pump that's coming out hopefully within the next year or two called the MVAD. And then there's a, a, yet another company called Reliant Heart, which produces the Heart Assist 5. And this is another axial flow device, although it's one that has been uh, updated and modified with some uh, kind of new bells and whistles for the, for the current era. So with all these options available, of course, it can be very confusing as to how we decide which one is right for each patient. But luckily, there's a lot of guidelines that kind of help guide us. And there's a few things that we look at. And if you were to come and, and discuss this with a heart failure cardiologist or a surgeon, these are the sorts of things we would go through. And so one of the first questions we have to answer if somebody's a candidate for long-term mechanical circulatory support is whether or not they would be using this device as a bridge to getting a transplant or if they're not a transplant candidate, then maybe just what we would call destination therapy, meaning that the patient would go home and just live with the device and, and uh, not have to worry about heart failure uh, in exchange for going through one of these surgeries. So the common things that, that would rule somebody out for a transplant, the most common one is probably age. We usually would say 65 years old is kind of our cutoff for where we would consider somebody for a transplant, although there's obviously exceptions to every rule. Oftentimes, obesity can also be a uh, deal breaker for a transplant, and so if somebody has a lot of obesity, then we might recommend a, a uh, destination therapy strategy. And finally, a lot of times people are smoking. They just haven't had a chance to quit and be off cigarettes for six months, and so a lot of times uh, those patients would technically be considered destination therapy as well, although these are moving targets, obviously. A patient who has um, a pump implanted with the indication of destination therapy could also turn into a transplant candidate under the right conditions if they lost weight or stopped smoking. So these are kind of arbitrary definitions, as you can see, but they're important because for the approval for these different devices, and especially when we talk about clinical trials, it is very important that we distinguish which, uh, which device fits with which indication. So let's just start by going to the patients who do qualify for a transplant, and our goal is to implant one of these devices just to help them through the bridging period until they can get an organ. The decision we have to look at next is whether their left ventricle is the only ventricle that's failing or whether the right ventricle is also failing. And again, this is a complicated decision, but uh, we look at a lot of different tests to make this determination. And if somebody has just isolated left ventricle failure and their right ventricle is working pretty well, there's two devices that I've just mentioned that are currently approved for that indication. One is the HeartMate 2, the Thoratec pump, and the other is the HVAD, which is the hardware pump. Both very good devices and, and really proven to be effective for this indication. Now, in some patients, if they have uh, certain criteria met on their echocardiogram, we don't want to have a significant amount of valvular disease and there are some other things that we would look at as well, but in some patients, we can do a uh, minimally invasive implant of the hardware device if they're a bridge to transplant candidate. This is uh, an investigation that we're enrolling patients in right now, so it's, uh, it's still something that we're trying to kind of work the uh, details out with through a research study, but uh, certainly has been shown to be a very promising option for people who qualify. So with that hardware device, that can either be done through a sternotomy where we divide the sternum, or in many cases through a, a small left-sided incision where we can implant it uh, minimally invasively. There's also uh, two devices that are currently being uh, placed into trials for a bridge to transplant in patients with just left ventricular failure. And I've already talked about these briefly. Those are the Reliant Heart, the Heart Assist 5 is the name of that pump. That's uh, the one you see here on the left. And then the HeartMate 3, also the third generation Thoratec pump. And so these are being currently enrolled in, in research trials to determine the efficacy of these pumps for bridge to transplant with left ventricular failure. Now, if somebody has both ventricles failing, then we would usually recommend a, a total artificial heart strategy. And uh, there are two different sizes of total artificial hearts that are available. There's a larger size that has a, the, the volume of the ventricles is about 70 milliliters. That device is already approved for transplant. We use it very commonly. And there's a new investigational device for smaller patients that's uh, only a 50cc device that we, we can also use, again, as part of a clinical trial. Now, if somebody doesn't meet the criteria for transplant and they are a destination therapy type patient, we still look at these issues of whether they have left ventricle only or biventricular failure. 
And if there's only left ventricular failure in the picture, then the, the only really approved device currently is HeartMate 2. Now, that may change, and depending on when you're looking at this, probably a lot of this will become outdated because it's, uh, it's a very rapidly changing field. But as of 2015, this is the only one that's the approved device. There's also uh, a lot of investigation going on with some of these newer devices for the indication of destination therapy. So if you're not a candidate for transplant, you may still be a candidate for the Heartware device or the HeartMate 3 device as part of a trial. And then finally, uh, if you have both ventricles failing, biventricular failure with a patient who can't qualify for transplant, there's actually a study that we're enrolling patients in with that as well, and that's a destination therapy total artificial heart study where the heart is replaced with the mechanical device and, and patients are just uh, allowed to kind of live with that without the plan of going for a transplant. So as I've discussed, there's a, a lot of options here. Uh, it turns out most of these are actually driven by the conditions that the patient comes with and also the approval that we have based on which pump is allowed for each of the different conditions. I would say that the majority of our patients actually end up being enrolled in a clinical trial. We have five or six clinical trials uh, just related to these pumps at any given time. And uh, the nice thing about that is that it allows us to offer patients the newest devices and they have a wide range of options to choose from. And in cases where more than one device may be appropriate for a given indication, we will engage the patient in that discussion and see if, uh, if they have strong preferences one way or another. And again, one of the advantages of Mayo is that we really are one of the few programs that has the whole option available in terms of what device we can implant. Now, if you have more questions about this, uh, there's a number of different resources I can refer to you. One is we've actually published a textbook that highlights some of these devices, as well as some of the common indications and some of the common problems that we run into with, with these types of uh, conditions. And so you can find that on Amazon.com. I've got the, the book uh, cover here that you can look at. And then finally, of course, if you're, if you're really wanting to pursue this in more detail and, and talk to somebody, either a heart failure cardiologist or a surgeon about this, we have a lot of different options to, to go with from there as well. Uh, there's about 15 cardiologists here in Rochester, and there's five expert LVAD surgeons you could meet with here. We also have campuses in Arizona and Florida, and they also offer LVAD surgery in all of these uh, locations. So there's a lot of options here. The number that you can call to get an appointment or if you just have some questions is, is uh, right here. And I would encourage you to, to give us a call if you have any other uh, concerns or questions about this. Thank you.